The Arctic fox moves every year through a fascinating seasonal cycle. I saw this gorgeous one at winter time when he adorns the beautiful white fur, a perfect camouflage in the snow. At the summer months, he wears an entire different outfit, allows him to defend himself and hide away from predators all year round. And that is not the only trick the snow fox has. During summer, when many birds nest at the top of the port's cliff, the fox patiently awaits at the bottom. He catches eggs, newly hatched and injured birds, killing them and burying them beneath the rocks of the frozen soil. The fox remembers where he buried the food supply that is kept well by the natural fridge of the North Pole. And if that's not enough, the fox tracks polar bears and eats their leftovers. Pretty clever, eh? Oil is holding us back. It is poisoning our air, warming our world, and polluting our rivers and oceans. It's corrupting our government, funding violence, fueling extremism, and creating deep-rooted injustices. A healthier, greener, and cleaner future is the only option for us, and a terrifying idea for oil companies and parties of interest. This is a crucial time. Climate change is happening. But we are resilient, creative, and proud of who we are. We will work together to protect ourselves and the world we live in. We cannot do this shift alone. A world free of oil, cleaner, healthier, and more hopeful starts today for a better tomorrow. Hello friends from Save the Arctic Facebook. Go. Seems like we had some technical issues, Roy. Could you, well, let's start again. How are you doing? And could you tell us a bit about the Arctic Fox? Of course, of course. It's always exciting. I just came back from there yesterday, came back from Svalbard in the high Arctic. I see there are people from all over the world watching us right now. So hello to everyone from Korea. Asia and congrats about the World Cup and everything. But uh, so I came back from there, from Svalbard. It was really cold, about four degrees outside, and this is summer. And uh, every time there is an adventure, I met so many polar bears, 20 to be exact, went through ice and snow, and so of course the melting sooner of the Arctic snow, and also met the Arctic fox which is always a great opportunity to meet mother and cubs. That's awesome. Um, so can what can you tell us about them, these little animals? So the Arctic fox is a really adorable animal. They work in the summertime. I mean, they are usually their dens are underneath huge bird cliff and there they wait for birds to fall injured or they go and catch eggs and when they catch them they actually bring them the mother brings the the the, uh, the birds or eggs to their uh, cubs and they eat and they nurture on that and then they grow up and become adult foxes uh, what they, they cannot eat they actually dig and bury in the ground and they keep it there for, for cold times for times where uh, when there are no birds where they must rely on their stash to survive the harshest months so and it doesn't rot because the land is frozen it's permafrost putting your dinner in the fridge in the freezer and then you can eat it whenever you want that's what they do Actually, I've read the research saying they actually find 10 to 20 percent of what they dug and, and buried. So like most of it just they forget where it is. So uh, so they are curious. They are amazing animals. And of course, like like all the animals right now, they are also facing some uh, hardship in the changing climate of the Arctic. That's really interesting. Uh, we're used to see photos of the Arctic foxes and they are white. Is it always like this? 
So they are white in the winter time. They are white in the winter time when they need thick fur for insulation and white for camouflage in the snow. So uh, uh, in time they have their summer coat. Their summer coat is very short and it's brown for summer camouflage in the landscape of uh, Svalbard. So it's different. Uh, they are small. They are smaller. They're smaller than the red fox that many of you probably know. And they uh, uh, always ask, "How does a fox do? What does the fox say?" So they bark. They have like tiny barks, uh, which is really adorable. That's amazing. Um, are these animals curious and friendly? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, they are very curious and very especially especially the cubs so uh, I photographed them on uh, what was it uh, Saturday last Saturday which is like two days ago three days ago and uh, and they just you know they, they, they run they run they come closer they try to gr grab one of the people I was guiding one of their gloves trying to take it away uh, two years ago when I was there, they, they ca caught some sunglasses of somebody and just ran off with it. So, uh, uh, yeah, they're curious and uh, really easygoing fellas. Yeah. And are These they... These are images right now are from Saturday. They are really amazing pictures. Are they easy to find? Well, uh, in the winter time, it's different than the summer. In the winter time, uh, they are usually near towns where they try to scavenge on food, or they follow polar bears. So if you see a polar bear, there is usually a fox or two following them. So when the polar bear catches something and eats it, the fox comes later and eats scraps, the, the remains. So if you know, if there, there is a polar bear, there is usually a fox around. They are really smart. Yes. Um, and how, how? What do you think the the oil drilling in the Arctic can aff affect those little animals? Well, oil drilling in the Arctic can affect every animal, not just the Arctic fox, because uh, oil drilling can cause oil uh, pollution and oil spills. And if we will have an oil spill like we had in the Gulf of Mexico that would have catastrophic effect on the Arctic because the black oil, the black tar, really absorbs sun energy, really absorbs heat and causes uh, a very fast accelerated rate of ice melting. And even one year without ice completely can cause mass extinction on a global scale for the art. So that's one of the reasons we are worried so much about oil drills and oil expo exploitation in the high Arctic. Yeah. And what is photography for you? <laughs> <laughs> photography is a way of communication, first of all. Also art. It's also passion but first and foremost it's a means of communication it's a way for me to deliver my impressions and, and my feelings and my uh, experience with these animals. decide whether or not to intervene in a situation where species like fox or polar bear are in danger uh, it's a really it's a really good question Elliot uh, actually, it's a dilemma. It's never an easy solution or an easy answer because the rule is you never interfere, you never intervene uh, uh, because it's nature and you need to let nature do its own thing. So, as a concept, as a principle, I will ne never interfere. If an animal is attacking another animal, it's because they are threatened or they are hungry or they are trying to survive. 
protecting one animal can cause real damage to another animal. And also, if, if even you animal stop, which is one of the hardest things to see, it's a problem to feed them. Because if you feed them, you start to, to associate foods with you. And that can cause damage in the long term, not only for this specific animal, but for the entire species, because from that point, they will try to go near people, and some people might uh, uh, take that the wrong way. So it can cause a really, really big problem. So feeding them for one minute it will not survive on the long term and can cause a bigger damage on the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Beatrice is also asking, how would you advise someone that wants to work with environmental sciences on her his 30s? Okay, so uh, first I'm, I'm, I really encourage everyone who can to help with these important causes. So uh, if you want to work with a scientist first, you need to look where which scientists, which projects, which, which grants, which universities are conducting research in this specific environment and start contacting them if they need volunteers. Uh, working with environmental uh, organization like Greenpeace, well, you can contact Green, Greenpeace directly. And I know Greenpeace is always looking for help and volunteers and funds and everything. And, uh, but it's not, I mean, I just, I don't want to discourage people, but it's not like if you're going to help them, they will send you to the Arctic and fund your your expeditions. Uh, it's usually the other way around. So every project, every research, every organization has its own uh, agenda and its funds and its own means of survival, which is never simple in our current reality. So we are always looking for people who will join, but you have to create your own infrastructure for that. And following the topic, uh, do you have any tips for wild photographers? Oh, of course. Well, first of all, the most important tip is get out there. That's the most important thing, because if people just fantasize about wildlife photography and they don't get out and actually take wildlife photos, it's not, it's not going to get you very far. So that's the most important thing. Get out there, experience as much as you can, whatever you can, in every opportunity you have. Uh, you don't have to go all the way to the North Pole, although I really recommend it. You can even start in your own backyard. You can start in your neighborhood. You can start in, in your state or county or in, in the general area where you live in because nature is everywhere. Nature is in, it's in your backyard. You can photograph birds, you can photograph foxes, you can find out which animals are living in your vicinity and just go for it. Just go and photograph. So that's the most important tip. And the more you spend time out there, the better chances you have to return with something good, something meaningful, something that's uh, uh, innovative. And when you get better and better and better, you start going out there furthermore to Africa, to the North Pole, to Kamchatka, to the Polynesians, to South America. Everywhere is nature, everywhere it's happening. Those are really good tips, so we just have to go out. Um, yes. <laughs> so tell us a bit about your last trip in the Arctic. How many times have you been there? How was it experiencing it now? So, um, my latest trip there was on a boat. It's summertime, so everything is melting. And uh, actually, comparing to last year, there was very little ice. Last year, when I was there, the same time of the, of the year, uh, in the first half of July, there was a lot of ice that we couldn't even circle the island of Spa, the island of Spitsbergen. This year, the ice has retreated really, really far north. And actually, there was so little ice that the ice 
ice, even in the full extent of winter, didn't actually touch the island of Spitsberg and the island of Svalbard, where I went. So actually, this year wasn't so good for ice. And if it's July, in July, the ice is already as far north as 82nd, 82 degrees north. Uh, all the polar bears have migrated out. So only very few polar bears have remained on the island. So it was hard to, for, to find bears, not so easy comparing to other years. Uh, and every year is different. Mm -hmm. We are seeing amazing photos right now of the Arctic foxes you found. Can you um, explain a bit those? Okay, sure. Uh, well, uh, the foxes, as I said, in the summertime, it's only the female who raises the cub. The male goes away. And so they eat as much as they can. The mother really likes to play with them around, so they are full of energy. And you can see running around vigorously. And uh, actually, if a male comes by, it will be a source of tension because a male can kill cubs that are not his own. Uh, so that could be really dangerous. So every time it's like a lot of tents and they are always hiding and they're always careful and cautious. So, uh, so it, it is uh, not so easy to survive. And when September comes, the fox is separated from their mother and they need to survive the first winter on their own and that's why you have a lot of cub mortality because a lot of them don't survive the harsh winter conditions on their own so it's it, it isn't easy to survive there uh, we see a question by Esley Wesselt saying what the biggest animal a fox will eat I know they eat rodents and insect grubs so aren't any uh, uh, there aren't rodents, uh, uh, seal carcasses that polar bears have eaten or hunted, and in summer times on all of those birds. Yeah, uh, just a reminder uh, for all the people who are watching us now uh, that they can see all your photos in your Facebook and Instagram websites yes. and your own website, personal website, right? Yes, sure, of course. And I always, I publish uh, more and more photos uh, because I didn't even finish to back up all my photos from Svalbard. So uh, I just uh, sent you three images just so we can show them on the live broadcast. Uh, but I share more of the foxes and the polar bear on my personal and social media. Great. Um, what camera did you use on this last trip? All right, so uh, I'm using a Nikon, a Nikon D850 with a 600 millimeter lens and the new Nikon 180, 180 to 400 millimeter F4 with the built in teleconverter. I'm using a Jitsu tripod and Manfrotto video head, and uh, my images uh, will be published in several magazines, and my videos will be published in several uh, uh, future. Uh, film that will be edited in the upcoming year. That's awesome. Uh, we have another question from Esli. Um, yeah. if, if the bears are going, how will the foxes get food? Where do they shelter? Um, well, in the winter time, again, the foxes can uh, retrieve uh, stashed away food, buried food in the frozen ground to Self, uh, fed in the harsh winter then and they also rely on polar bears if they won't be polar bears the foxes will have a harder time to survive in the winter time so we will see more and more foxes um, dying of starvation because although polar bears can go and survive without eating for months even six months the foxes cannot survive for that long without food so they always have to be fed. Polar bears, foxes will surely diminish in number. Great. Um, uh, they asked, so Ashley asked, where do they shelter? Well, yeah. well they, have, they have dens in the summertime under the bird cliff. Uh, in the wintertime, they jump 
just uh, huddle, they just uh, hug with themselves, <laughs> you can say, inside the thick, thick fur. They just get their nose inside the fur and like everything's covered. It like, looks a fluffy ball of snow. <laughs> And Beatrice is asking, uh, do you think tourism in the Arctic is a bad thing or not? That's a very good question, Beatrice. And uh, actually, it's, uh, it's a good thing if it's done correctly. It's a bad thing if it's done incorrectly. There is an organization of uh, tourist operators in the Arctic called the ECHO which uh, uh, created several guidelines that supposed to protect the Arctic and its inhabitants. If all the boats, if all the tourists that go there will follow acts by AECO, they, they will do a good thing. So tourism for the Arctic is a good thing because of tourism. First, it gets people aware of the Arctic and more people go to the Arctic, the more ambassadors we will have and of course for the wildlife there. Um, if people will harass animals, if people will uh, uh, abuse their given chance to visit the Arctic, uh, that of course will be a bad thing. And that's for, for tourist operators to protect because they know the people who go there usually don't know from right and wrong. And that's why we have to have responsible tour operators in the Arctic. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Roy, for being here and answering all the questions and explaining your experience. And thank you, everyone that has joined the live Q&A. Uh, thank you very much. For <laughs> we're expecting to see you again next week next Monday at the same time. Sure thing. Thank you.